Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are on planet Earth. Uh, my name is Jorge Diner. I have the pleasure to start another event of our Adassa International Summer Summit, Health Talks with Adassa uh, experts. And, uh, and this event uh, is very special because it's really a dialogue between uh, our expert from uh, Adassa, Professor Moses, that will be introduced in a second, and uh, three uh, uh, experts from Mexico. So it's really a colloquium, as we have called it. Mexico is one of the countries and communities where Adassa International has been working more intensively since the beginning of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And with nothing else from my side to say now, I'd like to introduce the host of this event as of every other initiative we've been organizing with Mexico. Celia Daniel, our leader and volunteer who uh, is sharing her knowledge, expertise, and passion for health by hosting this event. Thank you, Celia. Uh, shalom, good morning, uh, Mexico City. Good night, uh, Israel. I am very honored, uh, Jorge Etel, uh, Dr. Professor Moses, and all our doctors in Mexico City for having you all and all these people um, worried about uh, the situation in the whole world. I think uh, we don't know where really we're standing and we are in one of the most crucial moments from this pandemic. If everybody yesterday uh, hear the news uh, that the um, health director said that we are expecting the worst. That's pretty scary, don't you think? Uh, we really don't know where we are going and we are ready to listen from these experts what we should do. The countries are opening their, their, all the doors, people are going outside. What we should do? What we, should, we should wear the mask, we should go out, we should stay in. So uh, really I think uh, you are going to tell us a lot of these questions everybody's asking. Um, elderly people are in risk and the young people are going out, so they're coming in the house and we don't know if they're going to be contagious. Are the COVID tests are accurate? Because many people say they're not, not accurate. Are the antibiotics, if, every, if somebody already had the COVID, if they have the antibiotics, are they safe? So I think there are many questions we are waiting to listen from all these expertise. So thank you so much for making me part of this um, conference. And I think building bridges between Israel and Mexico is one of the most important uh, things now. And I appreciate having you all here. Thank you, Shalom. Let's start. Hello. Hello, everybody. Thanks, Celia. Thank you very much and welcome all of you. I have the honor to present today at this conference three experts in infectious diseases. They will present topic diagnosis, treatment, and research in COVID-19 in Israel and in Mexico. And we will be able to appreciate the similarities and differences between these two countries. Uh, Professor Moses has been involved with ADASA for close than four years, and currently he was elected president of the Israeli Society for Infectious Disease. Professor Galindo Fraga, director, deputy director and researcher of the Department of Epidemiology at the National Institute of Nutrition in Mexico. Dr. Francisco Moreno Sanchez, that is coming in, director of the Department of Infectious Diseases at the, at the Medical Center ABC, ABC in Mexico. And we, are the, and we are very, very happy because we have more than 450 people in the audience today in Mexico. And I want to thank also to our president in Mexico, in Adasa, Mexico, uh, Rafael Sara. Uh, I want also to, to thank to Professor Moses, to, Professor, to Dr. Moreno and Dr. Galindo on behalf of all the patients for having been at the forefront of the, this COVID-19 struggle that has affected all the humanity. Thanks for their leadership, their commitment, and their tireless work. Today we know that medicine has a universal impact, and thanks to medical collaboration, we 
will contribute to improve the quality of life and the well-being of all. Today, more than ever, societies and government have to invest in science and public health that are vital for the current world. So please, Professor Moses, the virtual floor is now uh, for you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, in the next 10 minutes, I'd like to give a short overview of uh, where I think we are and where we're going in terms of the COVID-19. Uh, and, you know, we now feel that we're experts in the disease. We've known it for six months. The whole globe is uh, talking only about uh, COVID-19 and the virus which causes this infection. And, and I think I hear you. despite the... A vast knowledge that has accumulated over the past six months. There's still many, many open questions like you alluded to, and uh, I hope we'll be able to clarify what we... Uh, we, we can't hear well. Can you hear me? Uh, in Israel, we entered the disease phase a little after other countries and we were able I think to learn a bit from uh, Europe especially and we prepared a little better we closed the borders uh, early relatively early so that we had uh, less infections from China certainly and our first infections were actually from the US and uh, <coughs> after passing the a large increase in number of patients, we were able to shut down society for several weeks and there was a fantastic drop in the number of cases. And we had uh, two or three weeks when there were actually almost zero new cases, uh, maybe up to 10 new cases, uh, zero uh, severely ill patients and zero new ventilators. So we were very happy. And about four weeks ago, uh, there was a lax in the, uh, in, in the uh, social distancing, uh, workplaces open, and we're now seeing a significant increase in the number of cases, of new cases from, as I said, close to 10 or more, uh, or up to 20 daily new cases, we now see over 400. And we're asked whether this is the second wave, and I think it's not the second wave. If a second wave would have been if the number of cases would go down without any intervention. And since there was, the, there was an intervention, uh, the curfew that was put on, then I think the number of cases dropped because of this intervention, and the increase now is not a second wave. It's clear now that when we've gone back that uh, the way to deal with, the current way to deal with the disease is through what we call non-pharmaceutical interventions. Why? Because we don't have a vaccine yet and we don't have any medication that will, uh, that can be given as prophylaxis, as prevention for the infection. So we are actually left with no medications. There are maybe one or two medications that seem to be uh, well for the ill patients. There's a lot of talk about uh, uh, steroids, dex dexamethasone and uh, remdesivir, which is an antiviral drug. These seem to work, but none of the other medications that have been tried up to date have been found to work. So the non-pharmaceutical interventions are keeping away, keeping distances, wearing masks, testing. I think this is a very important point. Testing in the first place to find out the positive cases. And once we identify the positive cases, we must do contact tracing and test them. If we look at the number of cases that Israel has done, per million population, we are 
uh, at the top 10 countries, and we've done over 100,000 tests per million population. We are currently doing uh, over 10,000 tests a day. This is very good. We've improved. We still have a lot to improve in the uh, delivery of results. We should be giving results if we really want to use the test prudently to get, to get the most out of them. We need to give result tests within 12 hours and we're still far away from that. If you look at the number of tests done in Mexico, I think the number is uh, on the low side. From what I've seen, it's around 5,000 per million. So this number of tests really should be increased to be able to identify uh, quickly. And I think that we've been seeing it in Israel, and I'm wondering what the situation is in Mexico, that the disease now focuses in uh, geographic areas. There are people who do not abide by the rules. Uh, they keep close together. They uh, don't use masks. So as I was saying, if we, we see focuses of infection in uh, certain communities, and the communities are usually those who don't abide by the rules. Uh, one interesting issue is the, the question of prevention, and there have been some studies, for example, on hydroxychloroquine, and uh, unfortunately, they've been, uh, to this point, disappointing. Uh, there's no clear study that shows that uh, hydroxychloroquine, that drug which is used for prevention of malaria, can prevent COVID-19. Uh, I think that the, this uh, drug is still open for resolution because uh, the studies that have been done, in my mind, have not been conclusive, and I think that we may be surprised about it. A big question is uh, the vaccine. Where do we stand with the vaccine? And I think that... Uh, on the one hand, from the beginning, the hope was that there would be a vaccine, that this would solve our problems. But all the medical uh, society really knows that vaccination is a long uh, process. You need to develop the vaccine, you need to test it, and even once you have a vaccine, you need to be able to uh, mass produce it and give um, hundreds of millions and billions of doses. So this, this is a very difficult issue. And although we cannot be uh, optimistic at this point about the timeline of a vaccine, I think that the solution will come from a vaccine. Uh, and the solution mean, means that we'll be able to go back to more or less normal life once there's a vaccine. Uh, and what we are trying to do is to do to make the best of the time until a vaccine or a prophylactic another prophylactic therapy will be available until that time comes our prerogative is to uh, keep the those at risk healthy to keep them uh, you know the elderly uh, people with risk factors like heart disease, diabetes. Uh, we now know that overweight people, uh, the morbid overweight are in danger. So all of these need to be kept uh, as safe as possible until uh, a vaccine is uh, developed. In the meantime, if you look at what is happening in Israel, for example, the increase in number of cases, as I mentioned before, is mostly of the younger population, those who went back to school. So we are actually seeing more cases, but only few more severely ill cases or ventilated cases. So although there is an increase, there is a definite increase in the number of severely ill and ventilated patients, but it's uh, proportionally less than it was before. And I think this is because the elderly population, those who are at risk, uh, keep far 
and, uh, and stay away. Another big issue that is discussed nowadays is the asymptomatic patients. How many asymptomatic patients are there? This issue still needs to be resolved. It's a very interesting and important uh, question because asymptomatics are those who do not display any signs of illness, but they can still infect those around them. And I think the, the equilibrium between testing a lot of the population, isolation of those who uh, have the virus and excrete it, and uh, testing on the other hand for antibody production and getting an answer for the question of how indicative the uh, antibody level is of uh, protection against the disease. These are still uh, relatively open questions, but we're getting more and more answers. I think that uh, we will learn that uh, those who have been infected are, at least for the short term period, uh, probably in immune. We don't know how long the immunization will last, uh, but they are probably safe for, for the short, short term. Uh, there's still a lot to be done and uh, the civilization will need to live with the threat of new viruses coming. Just today there was a, a, an interesting article in a very important journal about a perhaps new influenza uh, virus Coming from uh, coming from China, and we're not sure whether this uh, is uh, will have any clinical significance. But it's uh, it, it's clear that uh, the uh, scientific world is much more alert to the possibility that coronavirus-like pandemics could come around again, and we need to be alert. Uh, to be able to identify uh, such uh, new threats as, for example, a new uh, H1N1 influenza virus. I think I will end here. Thank you, Professor Moses. Um, we will get back to you with some questions. We apologize for some technical issues with the sound, and uh, we will fix that in the meantime so when we get to the questions and answers in the second part of the event, hopefully you know sound will be, will be uh, better. Um, we'll move now to uh, Dr. Francisco Sanchez. Please, Dr. Sanchez. Hello, I'm uh, gonna share with you a presentation I need you to uh, let me uh, share my presentation with you. The host needs Good. to let me. But you can share now. Okay, share now. thank you very much. So what I'm gonna try to ex explain to you is what we are having here at, at this hospital. I work in a private uh, hospital, it's called American British Calgary Medical Center. Uh, this is a two uh, campus uh, medical center in which one of them was uh, made for only COVID patients. So what's our uh, numbers right now? We uh, yesterday, we, we all, all, every day have the numbers of the cases, the new cases and the number of deaths. Unfortunately, we are now the uh, 11 country with more cases and the seven country with more deaths. So our numbers have increased in the last three weeks. We have doubled the number of cases and we have doubled the number of deaths. Um, if we compare what's happening with Mexico to what happened with Israel, in Mexico it seems like uh, we are getting to that peak. We still don't know when that that peak is going to be. We don't know how long is that going to peak going to be because we have not made uh, the number of tests that we would like. We are the country 148, uh, 148 countries ahead of us have made more uh, tests than uh, we that we have. And the other problem that we had is that the isolation uh, program that was implanted in Mexico was uh, very light. So a lot of people uh, remained in the streets for a long time. So if we compare what's going on with Israel, it's a very different the graphic. Uh, as uh, Professor was saying, it seems like you're having a second, uh, a second wave 
in Mexico, it seems like an eternal first wave. So uh, we are uh, at risk of reopening right now because um, it seems like the wave hasn't gone uh, down. And um, in, um, in uh, the ABC hospital, we developed a, a COVID uh, committee in February, seeing what was happening in, in Asia. And uh, we made a definition what the COVID area because the hospital is a general hospital. So we isolate an area for only uh, COVID patients. We uh, define what was a, a respiratory trash as part of the emergency room. And we develop a COVID treatment with a protocol in accordance with the uh, Shanghai Hospital, uh, with a Seoul Hospital, with uh, Barcelona, and with uh, a Milan Hospital. And uh, recently we have been in touch with uh, Emory at Atlanta. So we have a once a week uh, crisis committee in which we try to develop a standard of treatment and standard of care for these patients, trying to uh, define which are the best treatments. As you know, there's a lot of uh, information coming out every day. Many of them uh, are different from what it's, uh, in the one center is doing. And it has been def very difficult to make uh, ev um, medicine uh, uh, based in evidence because the evidence is changing every day. So first we decided to classify COVID-19 with the guidelines of the Census of Disease Control on, of China. Uh, we defined three uh, different uh, grades, mild disease, severe disease, and critical disease. Mild disease was very important to define because we didn't want the, the hospital to be uh, uh, full of patients that not needed uh, uh, to be hospitalized. We, we were uh, very concerned about the, pos the possibility of getting over uh, load and uh, we uh, try to be very uh, specific in which patients need to be admitted to the hospital. We uh, define severe disease as, as uh, patients that have uh, uh, respiratory problems with uh, which were not uh, being able to uh, achieve uh, uh, oxygen level above uh, 90 percent and critical disease was the presence of severe pneumonia uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome sepsis or, or uh, multi-organ failure so what are our, our, our data this was a, a paper that we published with the 50 first cases that we had in the hospital now we are uh, 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 submitting another paper in which uh, we are having the, the first uh, 232 patients that have been treated here in the hospital. It's very uh, interesting that what has been shown in other countries has been also seen here in Mexico with the age being a, a risk factor. But uh, the thing that is uh, very concerning for us, well, the other thing that is common in other countries is that there's a, a relation uh, 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 susceptibility for, for man over woman, there's uh, three uh, patient, male patients for every female patient. But the problem here in Mexico has been obesity. Uh, most of our patients, 75% of them, are uh, having a uh, high uh, uh, body mass, mass index. Many of them are in the grade of uh, severe ob obesity. And the other thing that is important and interesting is that not all patients that were admitted at the beginning had a PCR positive. And uh, uh, we have seen patients that have really severe pneumonia and, and because you have the test done in the mouth or the nose, the test came back uh, negative. Uh, that was one of the reasons that we decided that the CT scan of the lung was very important in the diagnosis of uh, COVID. This is a, a normal lung and this is a lung of a patient that has COVID. And this is really a, 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 a very characteristic uh, appearance of the COVID in the lung in which you have several parts of the lungs involved, multifocal, what, what we call multifocal disease. Um, here, it, it, we, uh, we have seen patients, uh, most of them have uh, uh, been in, um, uh, coming to the hospital very late. That's, that's another problem that we have in Mexico. Patients are afraid of coming to the hospital or they don't measure the oxygen level. It uh, has been something that we have tried to make the community uh, very aware of that you may be, be in developed uh, hypoxic levels and because this is running so so slow you don't uh, feel the, the the hypoxic levels until you are very uh, low in oxygen levels so many of the patients came late to the hospital so that this is why we have a high number of patients that come with critical pneumonia and this is very important because the median length of stay 
for a patient that comes with chicken pneumonia is one week. Instead, the, the patient that requires a, a ventilator will remain in the hospital for three weeks, and this gets the hospital uh, capacity runoff of ventilators, not beds, ventilators. So uh, it has been very important to try to uh, maintain the patients uh, aware that if they have COVID and they start having lower levels of oxygen, come early in the disease so we can treat them and uh, avoid getting them intubated. Uh, uh, the patients that were uh, intubated in, in the severe pneumonia, all of them were extubated. We had uh, the mortality that we're having in the hospital is, uh, is 3.8. Uh, many of them are critical pneumonia. We have a patient that came to the hospital. He was an, an, an elderly patient that uh, uh, made a, a, a DNA, uh, do not res resuscitate the uh, uh, letter. Uh, but uh, most of them have, we have a lot of exit uh, with the, the therapy. And me, this is mainly because of the critical care uh, assistance. Uh, we think that uh, one of the things that make uh, our hospital with a low mortality is that our uh, critical care unit is, is one of the best of the country, probably with, the, with Nutrition and another uh, two or three hospitals in Mexico, those are the best uh, uh, critical care. And this is a disease that requires very good critical care doctors because they need to know how to handle uh, liquids and, and the ventilator specifically. And um, we have a uh, run different uh, treatments. As, as you know, uh, we first start with what was uh, said in France that it was very good with the combination of uh, acetromycin and doxycycline. But uh, as I was making my presentation yesterday, uh, uh, it's, it's interesting because if you look, many of these medications have been uh, shown not to have in the, uh, yesterday the recovery uh, uh, paper with Caletra demonstrated that this is not something that is very useful, uh, especially as monotherapy that was shown by the New England Journal of Medicine uh, many weeks ago. But yesterday, the, the study shows that probably Caletra is not uh, helping that a lot. And, and we are also afraid of using hydroxychloroquine because of the risk of, uh, of cardiotoxicity. Uh, really, we are uh, running uh, different uh, medications without an evidence that they are working. We don't have remdesivir in Mexico. So uh, probably what is working better for our patients is the, the, the start of the steroids. Now with the dexamethasone study in recovery, also we start giving dexamethasone very early when the patients start having low oxygen levels. And the other medication that has been useful in here in Mexico, in Mexico is uh, tocilizumab, that is a, a, an antagonist of the uh, six uh, the interleukin. So, um, we don't have the data complete of this, uh, of, of the efficacy of, of the uh, different uh, drugs, but uh, it seems like, at, at, at least in my uh, point of view, that it's the supportive that you receive from the critical care area, and probably the use of early steroids and uh, some antagonist of as, as tocilizumab was really making a difference. But it's, 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 it's very difficult, it has been very stressful that uh, we receive um, papers that show something and when you run uh, a uh, trial that is um, uh, really a, a, a good trial, maybe the, re the results are not the ones that you are uh, able to experience. So in one of my conclusions is because Mexico is still with a high level of uh, contagious in the community and without uh, a very effective treatment, uh, the best uh, medicine that we can offer our patients is preventive medicine is keeping the patient in, in home if they can and keep the measures as uh, uh, washing hands, uh, do not touch your face. Those are the uh, measures that really have helped not to have uh, our hospitals overwhelmed. Uh, there have been some weeks in which we have been, uh, uh, we needed to close the hospital because we were, we were not having enough ventilators, but now it seems like a little bit, uh, we have a little bit decrease in the numbers of the patients, but I'm afraid that we're still having a long way to go. So I will finish my presentation uh, and I, I really appreciate you inviting me in this uh, uh, symposium. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez, and we'll move now to Dr. Galindo Fraga. 
Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Thank you for uh, Hadassah International and Hadassah Mexico to Etel and Dr. Jose As for uh, the opportunity to share this minute with uh, Dr. Moses and Dr. Uh, Moreno. And I also am going to share you a presentation only to to show how is my hospital. So thank you very much again. Okay, I uh, work in the National Institute of Medical Sciences and Nutrition, Dr. Salvador Suran, here in Mexico City. We know the hospital as Nutrition or the Suberan, and well, that's the entrance of the hospital. We are a third level academic hospital. The, we are devoted to internal medicine only for adults. We don't see trauma, we don't see uh, obst obstetrics and gynecologic uh, problems. We only uh, saw uh, internal medicine problems. We are part of the National Institutes of Health uh, System here in Mexico, and we are an, a research and training center uh, for different uh, internal medicine specialties. We are in the south of Mexico City, uh, and I need to uh, mention that because Mexico is a very big country and Mexico City is a very complex city, so it's important to, to, to mention that we are almost sectorized the, the city and we are in south Me Mexico City. We are not a very big hospital, we only have 120 beds, uh, those the critical areas, and we have uh, around uh, 30,000 old patients visits each month. Um, when we face the COVID-19 uh, problem, uh, as part of the national plan, we have to reconvert our hospital from uh, internal medicine hospital to a complete uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, hospital. Uh, here in the south of Mexico uh, City, we have the, uh, it's called the um, hospital zone because there is at, at least three very close National Institutes of Health and we share with the uh, National Institute of Respiratory Diseases this task of uh, be uh, complete COVID uh, hospitals. At the moment, we have uh, been, uh, I, I make some numbers for this presentation, so uh, up, uh, update yesterday, we have evaluated uh, a little more than 6,000 patients in our triage. And uh, well, this is something that is different of the national uh, politics and uh, indications. We, we, lot make, uh, we, we make a lot of tests here in nutrition. And that's something that sometimes is not good seen, but uh, we, of, of these patients, we have uh, uh, a little more than uh, two and a half thousand positive tests. And as uh, Dr. Moreno said, we have also patients with a very severe respiratory disease, absolutely compatible with COVID-19, that their results were negative. At this moment, we know that the PCR tests uh, in all the world uh, are not 100% uh, accurate. Maybe we have a uh, 30% of false uh, negatives. Uh, uh, of all these patients, we have hospitalized um, 1,300 and a little more uh, patients, uh, 250 in the critical care, and unfortunately, we have uh, uh, 300 deaths. I have to mention that uh, something that is different from the uh, ABC hospital is that our age, the age of our patients is a little lower. Maybe if our average is 40 years old and all the complicated patients and all the uh, diseases patients have another comorbidity, most of them metabolic problems and from that uh, obesity, as it was mentioned, and diabetes mellitus uh, are, are the, the, the most prevalent problems. Um, oh, only I 
quickly because uh, Dr. Moreno showed this information. I only uh, want to mention from these numbers, that is uh, the numbers we have yesterday, that as I mentioned uh, before, uh, uh, Mexico is a very big country. So we are seeing these curves in the ascending part, but uh, it's clear uh, at this moment for me that it is that, that is the average and that we have uh, different curves in different cities. Uh, by example, this central part of our country that is called the Bajio, at this moment is beginning with the activity of the uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, SARS uh, some other cities like Mexico, uh, Mexico City, we are seeing, and I have a slide uh, after a few more, that um, we are having a little less cases at this moment. Um, but Mexico City, because of the size of the city and the number of uh, habitants, uh, are, is the most affected uh, city at this, at this moment. As you can see, uh, we have a lot of cases. And the other thing that I have to mention is that, unfortunately, it's, it's said before that we are not doing a lot of um, a lot of uh, tests, so uh, that's because of our health uh, poli uh, public health policy that is uh, well following that this sentinel model that only makes some tests in some hospitals, and these numbers are only a part of what is happening. It's not the total numbers of um, persons with the uh, disease and it's not the only uh, the total number of deaths that we have in our country. Um, about the research in the hospital at this moment we are running uh, 39 observational uh, trials and 11 um, randomized clinical trials with different treatments and I only uh, will summarize uh, here some of our treatments we have the opportunity to participate in the first remdesivir uh, trial. And well, at this moment, we are running with the same uh, group from the NIH uh, USA, uh, the second, a second arm of that uh, randomized trial with the remdesivir, but uh, plus a uh, biologic treatment, another uh, treatment to control the immune risk, uh, response, that is baricitinib. We are using a lot of tocilizumab uh, we are running some uh, some trials that, uh, well, if you hear some of the scientific news of the last uh, weeks, uh, as coach is seen that we are running since the beginning of the of the uh, epidemics, and some groups have reported that it could be useful. Uh, we are uh, starting to run a commandant plasma uh, uh, trial. And I think it's interesting to, to mention because uh, some of the questions I have seen in, in, the, uh, in the chat is about the uh, immunity that could uh, leave this infection. And we have found that uh, something that at this moment we don't have a complete explanation, that is that uh, only a few patients, maybe half of the patients that have donated her, uh, their plasma, have that uh, letters that we call as neutralizing antibodies. And we don't know how the it means because uh, we only use that plasma for the clinical trial, but we don't know if the uh, persons who have uh, suffered the infection and don't uh, have neutralizing antibodies are more susceptible or they are at this moment uh, immune to the, uh, to the infection. This is something that we are exploring at this moment. Uh, one of the problems we are facing at this moment is the hospital acquiring infections, particularly something that is, ha has been described in other centers as the invasive uh, mycosis caused by Aspergillus. And we have unfortunately some cases here also. And uh, th this uh, graph uh, shows you uh, the uh, hospital uh, occupancy at this moment in, in Mexico City. As you could see, the trend of 
the numbers is uh, at this moment uh, uh, following a down way. So the authorities have decided, as uh, Dr. Moreno uh, and some of uh, the, the other participants have said, have decided to start the opening of the activities here in Mexico City. I suppose it will be in a planned manner and I hope that we could follow that indications and this is going to be evaluated week by week in order to uh, know if there is no an increase in the number of cases and if it is necessary to return to the uh, quarantine and the other uh, measures that has been taken. Because of that, we are facing the challenge of change the hospital again. We have only uh, one, uh, one place, so we are going to need to deconvert, uh, sorry for the Spanish, to deconvert our hospital back in order to be an hybrid hospital and to see COVID patients and non-COVID patients again. And the other challenge that we are planning to, and are, we are trying to be prepared to face is the, this that is called the syndemia between flu and COVID in the next uh, winter. Thank you very much for your attention you. and we are open for questions. Thank you so much. Uh, where is Dr. Dr. Yossi Ash uh, will uh, lead us with some of the questions uh, that he has and some of the questions that were posted on the chat by the public for the next few minutes. I think this has been a, a very interesting contrast to see the different uh, situations. Uh, Yossi, please. The first thing, uh, thank you very much uh, for the, the invitation. I, the first thing I want to say is that Mexico is two different countries. The, it, the medicine is not like in Israel, Mexico. We have private health and we have public health. We had an extraordinary presentation by, by Dr. Moreno uh, about uh, one of the best private hospitals. And now uh, we heard uh, Dr. Galindo, and thank you very much, an extraordinary presentation about the public hospital. So we don't have the same medicine in private health and public health, and you saw the difference. Um, uh, I have uh, a few questions from the audience here. Uh, is there any uh, uh, experience with ivermectin plus zinc? Uh, any of the panelists uh, can answer that question um, for us? We, we, may I answer? Sure. I we, we have an ongoing trial with ivermectin as a treatment for early disease in uh, uh, mild patients. Uh, it's a study which is conducted by uh, Professor Schwartz, Eli Schwartz. Uh, he, he's doing a double blind randomized trial of ivermectin versus placebo. Uh, it's a good question, but the answer is still out. I think there's several medications where, you know, I, I saw that there are a few questions about medications. Is dexamethasone good? Is uh, plasma good? All these uh, questions are very good questions. We probably don't have an answer for any of them, but we need trials to prove if they're effective or not effective. We're still not there. So I think ivermectin and plasma and uh, some other medications, the anti-IL-6 are all candidates and uh, we don't have a final answer for any of them. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moses. Uh, yes. Yeah, only I mean, I totally agree with Dr. Moses. I only went to say that, uh, as he said, these kind of treatments need to be run in clinical trials. At this moment, we don't have enough information to recommend as general treatment. In particular, ivermectin has a very good activity in vitro, but the levels in lung, at least at the doses that is usual to use, is not, not good. So we need to wait for the results of the clinical trials. Thank you. Okay, the other thing I want to say is Mexico is very different to Israel in, in, um, 
the amount of people we have in Mexico, as Dr. Galino says, is a very large country and we don't do testing like in Israel. I know that in Hadassah, uh, they started doing a, a testing of all their personnel once a week and everyone has a sticker that says, uh, I'm negative and the, the date that the, the test was done. In Mexico, we don't do that. In Mexico, testing is something that it's not working. We have very, very few tests. And uh, I had a test myself in the public system and it took three weeks to come back for the results. So uh, I think that uh, one of the difference that uh, Israel has is the, the testing method that we, don't, uh, we are not doing. Uh, not, at least not in the public health system. In, in uh, private health system, I'm very proud to say that ABC Medical Center is one of the best hospital that uh, best hospitals in Mexico that treats COVID and has uh, a very very extraordinary results. Uh, uh, maybe we have a better results than many other places places in in, uh, in the world. And I'm proud to say that that's because Dr. Moreno and uh, his team uh, leadership. Uh, uh, what else? Uh, how people are, are asking how reliable are tests for COVID-19? Uh, Dr. Moreno, if you want to answer that. Yes, I, I think that's a very important what we present because uh, the the people think that every test is 100% sensitivity and 100% and specificity. The reality is that's not true, especially in, in COVID. Uh, the PCR, which is the best test for the diagnosis, it's uh, around 85% of uh, sensitivity. And the problem with that is that you're going to have patients that are admitted to the hospital with all the clinical picture of a COVID. But the family is different. It's difficult to understand why you're admitting a patient to a COVID area when you have a negative test. But that that happens. Now we are trying to learn something about serological tests, and it's been very difficult to understand how this virus. Uh, uh, com uh, uh, reflects in the immunity system because it's not the antibody the only thing that is going to prevent uh, or, or protect you from immunity to the long term. Uh, we are running tests for uh, IgG, for uh, different types of antibodies. Mon most of those tests are because you want to have a, a treatment that is a convalescent plasma treatment. But the, the other thing is that you your thought would be that if you are IgG, you will be protected. We don't know how long, but, but uh, you have some immunity that can protect you for, for some time. Compared with SARS-1 uh, and MERS, uh, those viruses are very similar to, to, to COVID. And, and uh, the immunity uh, remained for around 12 months, 18 months. So you will expect something similar to, with COVID that we don't know yet. And the problem is that the results from the antibody test have been very un, uh, 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 unclear. There are patients that were asymptomatic, they have a PCR uh, positive, and then they don't uh, have good levels of IgG. So I think we need to learn more about the, the immune response from this virus. We hope that the immunity is uh, multifocal, so we'll have immunity for some time, but it has been very tough to, very, to interpret the results of uh, serological tests. Thank you very much, I'd Dr. Like Moreno. To, I'd like, may I say something about the sure. PCR test? Sure, Dr. Moses, sure. Uh, I think we have to realize that the PCR test on its own is a good test. The test in the lab, if you take, uh, if you take some virus and you try to identify it with the PCR test, the test is very good. The problem is really with, with the, in two ways. One, the sample that is taken. Was the sample taken well enough? Was the swab that was taken well enough? Sometimes the swab is not taken in the proper way. It's not taken from the nasopharynx. It's not taken deep enough. And then if you don't have the virus on the swab, you can't find it in the lab. And the other problem is that some patients, for some reason, do not excrete a lot of virus. And we've seen that uh, we've had patients, uh, uh, like you said before, doctor, that uh, were clearly with uh, COVID-19, but their tests were negative. And only when they were intubated and you took, and we took a test from deep inside was the test positive. So I think the, the sampling 
uh, is the difficult part and not the, the lab test by now, I think is over 90 or even 95% accurate, but uh, some people excrete less virus and sometimes it's difficult to take the swab and that's where the PCR is a, is a problem. Thank you very much, Dr. Moses. Uh, one other question, I am a pediatric surgeon and uh, one of the uh, things that we're thinking now, uh, it's, uh, we are afraid, many people are afraid of this, uh, PIMS, this uh, pediatric inflammatory multi-organ syndrome that comes after the COVID, the, the COVID wave in adults. And that uh, I, I would like to ask Dr. Moses, what, what experience you have in ADASA uh, about that uh, syndrome, the pediatric inflammatory uh, multi-organ syndrome? You know, it's fascinating to see how an astute clinical observation is necessary with such a disease. We all remember that just two months ago, someone noticed that the sense of smell and taste disappeared early in the beginning, and it wasn't clear, and now everybody knows this. So, and th this is due to an astute clinical observation, and the same is true for the acute inflammatory disease in children. Uh, just a few days ago, it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that this is actually a disease that is probably associated uh, with uh, post-exposure to, uh, to uh, COVID-19 uh, virus. And uh, uh, fortunately, we've seen maybe one case. Uh, in Israel, there were a few cases described. Uh, there was a debate because uh, in the first three cases, only two, two negative for the virus and one was positive. So I think there's still a debate whether it truly is a disease. At least there was a debate. I think the paper, the current paper in the New England Journal of Medicine probably nails down that uh, it's a, a disease like we know, you know, it's similar to Kawasaki that we've seen uh, before. Uh, in, uh, in children with uh, a post-infectious uh, immunological type of reaction. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a true disease probably associated with, uh, with coronavirus. Okay, I can tell you that in Mexico, at least at the ABC Medical Center, that the IMF Chief of Pediatric Surgery there, we haven't had any cases. And, uh, but in public hospitals, I also work at the National Institute of Pediatrics, we have seen a few cases, maybe 10, 15 cases with this inflammatory response syndrome uh, uh, we, uh, due to COVID. So maybe uh, it's a nice topic to, to discuss later. Uh, I think we are on time, Jorge, maybe you can close the, the, the session. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Yossi. There are there are many questions, and uh, we'll make sure that uh, the questions that are on the on the chat are being recorded. So we will uh, send these questions to the three doctors that presented. Um, I think that uh, you know these are incredible times, extraordinary times, and to have an opportunity to listen to uh, all of you <coughs> experts uh, in Israel and uh, Mexico uh, to to educate us, to share with us the knowledge you have and how you are looking at this. That, that in itself, I think it's something that is invaluable. And, and Celia and, uh, and Jose Yossi and uh, Ethel uh, in Mexico organizing, organizing this. Uh, and, and of course, you know, Professor Moses, Dr. Uh, Fraga uh, and Dr. Sanchez, you, you in, uh, in Mexico. You know, it's, it's a remarkable event. You know, we started this crisis at Adasa calling this moment together we live. And I think that, I think together we also create solutions. Together we can heal people better. And uh, this is not just a period of, uh, of uh, health challenge. I think this is a period of uncertainty. And you know, in every, uh, I am in the, and running and facilitating and organizing sessions like this almost every day and uh, talking with, with doctors, you know, in Israel and all over the world also about this. Uh, and there is a level of anxiety that we all have because we don't have all the answers people want to hear. And, uh, and some people, you know, come and say, stop talking about this because there is fatigue. 
You know, people are tired of listening about COVID. I think we're all tired of living with COVID. But I think, you know, that's not something we choose. That's not something we want to have. But uh, we can't deny reality. And the reality is that uh, we don't know when this will end. But the only thing that I think the scientific world and, and the medical professionals, like the amazing professionals on this uh, event, uh, and in the case of Adassa, uh, with, with all the background of all the hundreds of experts that Adassa represented today by Professor Moses, I think that all we share and all we know is that we don't sleep, that we are working around the clock to make sure that we put end to something that uh, challenges us. You know, I think one of the things that we are used to have with all the telephones we have and all the calendars and schedules we have is to have control over our time. And we don't have control over time anymore through these times. But I think we can relax and feel better knowing that there are so many great people like uh, Yossi, Professor Moses, Dr. Fraga, Dr. Sanchez, and million more over, all over the world that are at this very moment talking among themselves to find a solution so that we can go back or go forward to a better life or to the life we used to have. We want to thank you and we want to thank the hundreds of participants that came to this event because they prove that even if there is fatigue and we are tired from COVID, we want to know more where we are heading and what we should do. Thank you so much.